Um, offensively is where we got to we got to make some hay. Um, we've not played as well up front as we need to play, and I think you all know my. As y'all y'all have been kicking the shit out of me for years for not drafting wideouts, and all of a sudden I look up and you know we're underperforming on the offensive line right now, um, and that's got to that's got to take another that's got to improve. What? Need I remind everyone that 2020, just a couple years ago, this was their offseason. Anthony Costanzo retired. He was a 10-year player at left tackle for them. And their only other left tackle on the roster was Julian Davenport, who arguably was the worst left tackle in the league. That same offseason in March, they lowballed Danico Autry and accidentally kind of chased him off the roster. He went to Tennessee, a division rival, and promptly ripped them a new asshole every time he played against them. So they had to replace a tackle and they had to replace a pass rusher in the same draft. And oh, by the way, wide receiver was pretty thin too. And so their plan to address all of this was to pass on Christian Derisaw, who was an elite tackle prospect. And I said that at the time, this is not just hindsight. I even said this was stupid at the time. They passed on Christian Derisaw and decided to roll with Eric Fisher, signing him off an Achilles injury. By the way, Eric Fisher is no longer in the league. And also Christian Derisaw is allowing less than one pressure a game right now. And instead, they drafted Quiddy Pay, who again, fine player in a vacuum. He's totally fine. But they wouldn't have needed to draft Quiddy Pay if they didn't lowball Danico Autry. And then somehow that's Alec Pierce's fault? Are, are we insane? Like, to me, isn't the job of general manager to make sure that every position is okay and to draft receivers when you need receivers and to not lowball a, a really good pass rusher into leaving for a division rival and also to understand the hierarchy of positional importance when you're trading for Carson Wentz, who's horrible under pressure? Shouldn't you maybe have a franchise left tackle for that type of quarterback? Or, I don't know, a nine million year old Matt Ryan who can't move anymore? Who's building the roster here? I, I, I just, I, I don't understand the argument by Chris Ballard as if this is a defense. But anyway, this video is not really about that. This video is about something that might be even worse, and that is the hiring of Jeff Saturday to be the interim head coach. And full disclosure, I actually heard Jeff Saturday is a pretty nice guy. Like, I used to work in sports TV. It's a pretty, you know, small pool of people. So I worked with people that also worked at ESPN and worked with Jeff and worked with all the on-air talent there. From everything that I've heard, he's a really good dude. And this is not about him personally whatsoever. This is about the human element of coaching and what a decision like this does and all of the ramifications that it has. And there's a few different elements to this, some that I think have even more merit than others. I think, you know, looking over the conversation that's been had over the last day or so since this hiring was announced, there's been a lot of talk about the historical trends, um, you know, within the NFL when it comes to race and who gets hired for head coaching jobs and, and coordinator jobs and who doesn't. And that is a hundred percent valid conversation to have. And it should be had. I wish I wish it was had more often. But when it comes to this hiring, you know, in specifics, I don't necessarily think it's a race issue. I think it's a nepotism issue. And every single assistant on that roster that is qualified for that interim job and should be getting a shot, whether they're white or black or brown, you know, regardless of gender, regardless of background, every single assistant is affected by this. I think it's less about race and it's more about the fact that somebody who is not qualified for the job skipped the line in front of everybody else who is qualified, regardless of their background. I want people to understand the existential dread that comes with being a football coach on a losing team, and especially one that is completely falling apart like the Colts. Every single day you walk into that building, every single week, with every single passing loss, you're waiting to be fired. Like, you are expecting to be fired. You know you're going to have to list your house and move across the country and pull your kids out of school and make them say goodbye to all of their friends and, you know, make new friends in the middle of the school year because you're going to get hired in January and then you got to do draft prep and, and you're moving and, you know, it affects your, your, your partner's career. It affects everybody in your family because you lost your job and you know you're going to lose your job every single time you lose one of these games. 
it's horrific. And I've seen it happen to a lot of coaches. It happens to coaches every year. And it's almost an unavoidable part of the industry. But it's the worst part of the industry. And I think that is getting lost here is the human element of being a football coach. And when it comes to being assistant coaches on one of these bad teams where the head coach eventually gets fired, you know, one of the only good things about that situation is the opportunity to then become an interim coach because it acts, you know, not just as a job interview for your current franchise so that you don't have to move your kids, but it's a job interview for the entire league. And it's the best job interview opportunity anybody could ever ask for because it's less about sitting in a room and trying to convince some billionaire to you know give them a salary. And it's more so you getting to interview by actually coaching. You can even look at the Colts itself as an example. Like it was only a decade ago when Chuck Pagano unfortunately got cancer and he had to go get treatment in the middle of the season. They elevated Bruce Arians to be their interim head coach that year. And that was Arian's first shot at being an NFL head coach after 40 years, four decades. And he finally got his shot as an interim in Indianapolis. They go on a run with rookie Andrew Luck. They make the playoffs. And then he wins coach of the year. The very next year, he goes to Arizona. He gets his shot, you know, at his first permanent head coaching gig, whatever you want to call it. And he brings along Todd Bowles, who just a couple years earlier also got his first chance to be a head coach by being an interim in Miami. And then he was an interim defensive coordinator in Philly after Juan Castillo got fired and proved that he was really good at that too. And so Arians brought him along to be his DC. And a decade later, each of them have gotten a couple head coaching opportunities and have won a Super Bowl. And would either of them, Arians or Bulls, would they have gotten that opportunity were it not for, you know, them being interims first? We're never going to know. And I think that's what really frustrates me about this hire is literally within this own franchise's history, they have seen what elevating somebody from within on this staff that is qualified, they have seen what that can do for somebody's career and what that can do for the league. And they're hiring Jeff Saturday, somebody who, you know, A, was not on this staff, but was not on any staff and has no NFL head coaching experience or really no NFL coaching experience at all. So again, he is skipping over all these other assistants that could have had this opportunity and, in my opinion, deserve this opportunity, this opportunity they might never have gotten elsewise, otherwise, whatever the word is. He's skipping over all of them, and that doesn't sit right with me. And that's another thing that I think should be talked about is when these guys get opportunities to be interims and, you know, basically try out for the entire league, It's not just for their own job security, it's for all of the other lower level assistants job security too, because when they move on to another team to get a head coaching job or, you know, a a coordinator job, they can bring everybody else from their old staff as well, because everybody's getting let go. Everybody needs jobs. And so they'll bring their assistants along with them. And that's how guys can, you know, kind of keep their career afloat is their boss essentially gets an interim uh, opportunity and gets exposure. And then the whole crew, you know, gets to eat for another season. That's important. It's important, not just for head coaches and coordinators. It's important for everybody that is underneath them. Like that is how the coaching ecosystem works. It's about relationships. It's about, you know, putting in your time and, and spending hours and hours and weeks and weeks and years and years, and sometimes decades and decades putting in the work and grinding and building these relationships so that one day, maybe you can get an opportunity, even if it comes from somebody else being fired. One day, maybe you can get your shot. And it went to Jeff Saturday. Again, I do think there's a conversation that could and should be had about the extremely you know, slanted stratification of coaching hires in the league. Again, when it comes to who gets opportunities and who doesn't, that is a 100% valid conversation. But to me, this hiring affects assistant coaches of every race, every gender, every background. They all equally have a right to be pissed about this. And, you know, I know life sucks and life's not fair and all the other platitudes that people will, you know, put in the comments about, uh, you know, about how they've also been screwed in their own life and how they're doing just fine. So these people need to get over it. 
I get that. We've all got screwed at some point. I know I definitely have. And I'm sorry for all of you out there that have been screwed in your own careers by this exact type of situation, by some sort of nepotistic hiring practice. I genuinely am sorry that's happened to any of you guys because it, it, it gives me like a sinking feeling in my stomach knowing what all of these assistants are thinking right now. And if you also had to experience that, I'm genuinely sorry for you because this shit sucks. These are real people. Like this is real stuff. And there's real consequences for this, for everybody's career. Like if this doesn't work out for Jeff Saturday, he can go back to ESPN and make millions of dollars still being a great TV analyst. That job is always going to be there for him because he's a good dude and he's good in TV and everybody likes him. Like this is not about Jeff Saturday. But what are all the assistants going to do if this doesn't work out? Is is Jeff going to bring them to ESPN too? Probably not. So what are they going to do? That's what bothers me is they're just, they're getting screwed. And I don't like that. I really don't. Like this is a, this is such a people business. Coaching is a people business and they're screwing the people. And I don't like that. So these coaches, they work too damn hard for this to happen to them. And I wish them all the best because they're going to need it. That's it for now.